Every Night is Game Night, episode 66, Fantasy Flight's Winter Releases, featuring Imperial Assault, Fallout, and Legacy of Dragonhold. Hey guys, welcome back to Every Night is Game Night. This is Anthony once again with Jason. Yo, my peoples, what's up? All right, and we have a special guest with us this week from One Stop Co-op Shop. Colin's joining us to, to help out with some of these Fantasy Flight games. Hello, everyone, and thank you guys so much for having me. You yeah. are filling up the podcast airwaves, man. Kicking <laughs> yes, it off. Yes, I love yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we especially appreciate it because we had this scheduled, and I was going to talk about Legacy of Dragon Halt, and I popped up in my copy on Friday night and realized it was missing at least two things I needed to actually play the game. And so I have not actually played it yet. And so Colin is swooping into the rescue here to, to share his thoughts on the game. Thank you, buddy. Not a problem. Yeah, so what we are talking about this week is Fantasy Flight's recent wave of solo-friendly games. Uh, it's Legacy of Dragonholt and Fallout, the board game, both came out uh, same day, I believe. Yeah. And the Imperial Assault Legends of the Alliance app finally, finally dropped after about 16 months of teasing us and worrying about vaporware. Uh, so if you were a big Fantasy Flight fan, you had a ton of stuff that was all of a sudden solo playable. And so we're going to cover all three in one go. Let's do it. All right. So we're going to kick things off with the hottest of the hotness. This is Imperial Assault Legends of the Alliance. This is an app that I I was at the announcement for Gen Con a year and a half ago, and they said, hey, we're doing this app. And then crickets for like 14 months, literally nothing. People were beginning to wonder if they could get the license or if they were just messing with us or what it was. And this was only a couple of months after the Descent app had come out. Uh, that turned Descent into a full co-op or soloable game. So as somebody who is a huge Star Wars fan and has purchased all of the Imperial Assault stuff and played very, very little of it, I was very excited and have continued to keep up that collection and was starting to get just a little worried that maybe I was spending money on something I wasn't going to be able to play. But lo and behold, it finally came out. They released an article and then like eight days later it dropped. This is the same as the Descent app, it is an app that will automate and turn into AI the opposing player. So the these games, uh, Doom, Descent, Imperial Assault, they're all one versus many. In Imperial Assault, what you have is the Imperials, the one, versus the Rebels, the many. So the game takes over the Imperial side of things. Um, it is fairly similar to Descent and Doom and all that, uh, Imperial Assault. Uh, with the Star Wars theme, a few different rules have been streamlined and changed, but from a very general perspective, you're dealing with roughly the same system here, kind of a, a 2.5 or 3.0 iteration of it. The app is going to take over uh, the Imperials, like I said, and as the Rebels, you're going to get, playing solo, of course, you're going to get two characters. Um, if you play with you know, a full complement of people, you will have each one character. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the solo game, because that's how I was playing it. Uh, you're going to get Two activations on your turn, usually you only get one, so you're going to play each character twice every turn. So you're really doing four rebel activations per turn, kind of replicating the, the four on one. Um, you are going then going to do things like move, attack, interact with things, standard adventure game fare. Um, the game throws a whole bunch of different stuff at you, the enemies are pulled from the core box, there's a handful of different cards and stuff that come from the expansions, but for now the app just pulls from that core box for the most part. The combat is still dice based. Everything else is, you know, you got the the stuff in your hands from out of your out of your game box. Um, you're gonna roll based on your attributes from the weapons you have, different base attributes, different like if you're trying to unlock something or move quickly or attack or defend or whatever you're trying to do, it's gonna be based on. It's gonna tell you which dice you're gonna roll. Um, the enemy AI is fairly advanced, at least compared to you know some other games that do similar things. It will tell you where to place the enemies on the board. It'll tell you kind of how to map them out. And the tutorial kind of walks you through how to manipulate and move them around based on you know how the game's supposed to flow. The enemies, when they come up for their turn, it's going to have kind of a flow chart of sorts. So it'll start at the top and go down, and you'll activate what you can. So you're going to take those two actions on the enemy activation, and you start at the top, and if you can't do it, you move to the next one. If you can't do it, you move to the next one until you've done two. Um, if you do a combat action in there somewhere, you don't do any more combat actions and you just continue until you finished. After your games, after you've played each of them uh, during the campaign, you'll get a chance to upgrade stuff, spend different points you've gotten to buy new cards, put them into your pool, upgrade your characters. Kind of has a, has a cool video gamey feel to it. Uh, the actual app 
The tutorial is three or four short games, kind of walk you through the basics. It's good for newbies, I think. Yeah, if you already know the game, I still recommend going through it because the app changes obviously enough stuff for how the Imperials work um, that you need to know all that. Uh, but for people who haven't played at all, I think it's also still helpful to walk through it. I had not played my copy of the game in like two, two and a half years. So I didn't remember a whole lot and this helped me kind of get back up to speed. Um, the rest of the app is just one campaign at the moment, however. So compared to the fact that if you've invested in all the stuff for this game, you have four full campaigns and a couple of small supplementals, this only gives you the one. So we're hopefully going to get more. It makes it seem like you will get more. When you open the app up, you mark off everything you own. And it has everything that you can buy there listed, of course. Um, you mark it all off what you own, and then it'll pull in from that eventually as, it get, as the app updates. Anthony, the app, the adventure that's in the app, is that the one of the ones that you can buy for the one verse many? It's not. No, it's uh it's definitely a different adventure. And I, again, I haven't gone through the full campaign from the book, but I did open it up to compare them uh, to see if the story was the same and see if the initial kind of couple missions were the same. And they're not. So um, it's been changed. I don't know how substantially. It's kind of the same area um, story-wise, like where you're going and what you're doing. But the actual way it flows and where you are when you get into that first campaign is different. Um than what it was in the, in the original book. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but it gives you a little bit more replayability if you're going to play, you know, kind of out of the box rules. Or if you've already played all of those, you're not just doing the same campaign in the app. So that's nice. Um, so stuff I liked, it's Imperial Assault Solo. That's good. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's no one versus many. I'm not a, ha a huge fan of one versus many uh, in general. There's very few exceptions to this unless you can do a really cool system for it. Conan has a very cool system for it. The Others has a pretty cool system for it. Um, but the base, like, Doom Descent Imperial Assault system is not as much fun. I don't like playing Imperials every single time, which is what I had to do before. Um, the app is fairly intuitive. It teaches the rules nicely. It's fairly easy to get into. Um, and the campaign is engaging. I like the story and everything. Uh, the AI is pretty solid as well. Cons, for me, it's almost entirely about the content. There's just not much here. I ran through everything it had in a weekend, and I might go through it again, but I, you know, I don't know how many times I want to go through the same campaign, uh, maybe with just different characters or something. Um, but I'm really hoping for more soon because I own a lot of stuff for this game. So uh, being forced to use the core box over and over again would, would not be a lot of fun. But I'm sure they're working on that, so I'm not hugely concerned about it. The other weird thing here, too, is the app doesn't really have as much of that Star Wars ambiance that you kind of come to expect from any licensed Star Wars thing. Um, where's the music? Yeah, I know. They, I don't know if they just couldn't afford it. Well, I'm, I'm sure they just couldn't afford it. But there's just various pieces and bits that you expect in a Star Wars thing that aren't here. So it's a little disappointing. It doesn't ruin the game. But from a thematic perspective, it'd be nice to kind of have, you know, those sound effects and background stuff or like little character quips or whatever when those things come up that you know none of that's here but it's still star wars they meant they made it happen despite all the licensing issues they probably had so i'm happy my verdict is it's fun if you own imperial assault download it play it if you don't own imperial assault uh i don't know maybe wait for a little more content to come out give it a go play with other people play descent make sure you like this system first it's a pretty decent investment uh, for a solo game, if that's all you, the only way you're going to play it. But if you know you like it, if you've played Descent, if you played Imperial Sold at all, then the app is pretty solid. Colin, are you a Star Wars guy? Oh, yeah. I I went to the midnight showing of the, what, The Last Jedi? So, what yeah. a dork! <laughs> you better believe it! <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I can't stay up that late, but I was there at 9 a.m. the next day. So <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I don't blame you. So you, you, don't, you haven't uh, cracked the app open yet, right? No, I mean, I have it. I just haven't had time. Too many things going on. Yeah, I, I am not a Star Wars guy. I'm sorry. I was born in 77. I should be, but it's, it's never happened. <laughs> but So I don't have, like, an attachment to this. I, I will say I do prefer this over this. And I, I said this over on Co-op Cast uh, when we did our kind of rap review of it. I'd rather play this because this is fairly unique in the space rather than the 800th Dungeon Crawl. You know, because you can get any sort of cooperative dungeon crawls, but at least this one, there's not nearly as many space tactical games like this. So I'm happy to just kind of play in the space. The, um, 
one thing I noticed about the app, I agree with everything Anthony said. Um, there's some more tacticalness to the app. Like there's, you know, you're there's much more movement. I, I felt than the descent app, which I, I guess is right because in descent they're all like ogres and charging, you know, beasts, and they're all like they just kind of get in your face and do whatever. And maybe like one archer in the back is hopping around and repositioning. In this game, everything repositions, so you constantly have to fiddle with where where the app is telling you to put the enemy guy. So you can kind of cheat a little bit. It's like oh, I don't want to reposition this guy. That looks like a good spot. Oh. <laughs> 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 I guess you're not supposed to, but like then, like either you're doing that or you have to like tactically kind of calculate where all the enemies, you know, they move forward, they shoot and they come back, and they're all they all do that, or most a lot of them do that. I shouldn't say all, uh, but a lot of them do that. Stormtroopers definitely do that. Uh, so yeah, it, it a little bit of mental overhead, and the targeting system I think is a little bit trickier just in the base Imperial assault. So you have to kind of work that out as well. But these are niggles. These are minor things. Yeah, for sure. And I think I haven't really used the Descent app much, but that's kind of what I've heard as well, is that this has more stuff to keep track of and to do, which I like. I like kind of the, the tactical elements of it, um, especially compared to other uh, du- co-op dungeon crawly type things that have had any kind of AI, you know, out of the box or in an app. Um, I like that this one asks more of me as a player. So something to keep in mind. It's not an easy play necessarily. It's not a hard play, but it's not like a super easy one either. If if you want that easier kind of just chuck dice and go, Descent is more probably in that realm. For sure. Um, okay, so speaking of moving and chucking dice, <laughs> we have, look at that, segues here. That's what I got. Nice. Uh, so uh, we got Fallout. Uh, Fallout is based on the video game IP. Uh, the board game is designed by Andrew Fisher and Nathan Hajek, which just came out uh, only a little while ago. And I was uh, lucky enough to get a copy. So uh, lucky I paid <laughs> for the pre-order. The, the pre-order was not sold out. That was the lucky part. You're still lucky, uh, though. A lot of people can't find it. So <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the fact that I got him before the pre-order sold out. Uh, anyway, so, okay, large adventure game. Uh, it's not a board, per se. It's, it's, it's hexes that interlock, uh, and you get kind of, kind of a modular thing that way. But it is a large adventure game in the mode of Arkham Horror and Elvish Horror. Um, it's a, you know... It's a character in the universe, and you're traveling around the board, and you're doing quests, and you're beating monsters, and you then travel to the other side of the board, and you're doing those quests, and you're beating those monsters. You're it's that constant, like you know, feeling like you're going on a journey, and you're doing all sorts of stuff that's based on whatever the quests tell you to do. Uh, I'll get into the how the mechanics work in a second, but the uh, one of the striking things I want to talk about first was the art, then the art style. There's a divide. I I I kind of I kind of knew it. Uh, but it came, it came, it came to me as I was kind of reading what was going on around the game and around the video games. Um, so Fallout One and Two was very bleak, like very brown, and that's kind of what put me off of Fallout in the first place. I looked at it and my eyes just like ah, too much brown. <laughs> it gets is boring. And then the la- the latter Fallout's kind of like jazzed it up and made it um, made it almost look like a period piece. Like you can imagine if if the 1950 just kind of happened and it was a little bit more brown. That's kind of where it is. It's going to go on the second thing. So if you were afraid that, oh, post apocalyptic game, it's a boring uh, setting. No, they kind of follow the later style, which is, you know, a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more stylish. Uh, and, and like, it's Fantasy Flight. You know, Fantasy Flight does not, um, you know, they don't really skimp on their boards. They don't really skimp on their, you know, the ambiance. You may have, like, a little quibbles about their miniatures compared to other companies. But, you know, you're going to get top flight, uh, generally, components uh, and art style. So... Okay, uh, gameplay, uh, personal, uh, uh, personal character, personal power up. So you're gonna play a character, and you and you know people who are familiar with Fallout are gonna, you know, they, you get your ghoul and you get your mutants and you know all that stuff, all that good stuff is there. And you get a player board, and the upgrade system is pretty neat. Uh, again, everything evocative of the video game. So you're gonna upgrade these. You have like on your personal board, you have a seven slots for seven letters and the letter spell special strength perception endurance charisma intelligence agility and luck special uh so these are stats that you can upgrade in the video game in this game they they don't it's not that complicated right um what they do is they align with certain skill checks uh and that's really all they do uh so if you have s or for strength and you run into a a strength skill check you'll be able to roll again (laughs) <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's fantasy flight game, so you're rolling for your skill checks. Um, if you have an E for endurance in your thing, uh, you get to roll again. 
the more letters you have, and you, you're going to uh, level up as you go. Uh, the more rerolls you get, the more better. The better you're going to do at some of these skills. A really, really like kind of inventive, simple twist uh, to incorporate an element of a video game, but in, not in a way that creates a lot of overhead. Really, really simple. Um, okay, so then the quest system. So the quest system, I think, is why you're here. Uh, talking about quests and talking about skill checks, uh, that's kind of the heart of the game. So you're going to be, like I said, uh, walking around this hex grid. It's like you're going to start off with one quest. Everybody at the table, one to four players, starts off with one quest. Whoever does that quest first, it will lead to a specific other quest in the deck. In Eldritch Horror, you will just do the Mythos quest, and then you dis it disappears, and you get the next thing, and it's just random. So you just kind of string this story together from a random deck. Here, you're going to do a quest, and it says, go find uh, quest six, and then go find quest 48. So then you pull from a deck those specific quests, and then it's going to like pyramid out that way. So like... You'll do one quest, and then two quests, and then four quests, and then you follow a, a, the main quest line, and you follow a side quest line, and it all follows along a numbered system of um, of storyline. So, like, you can follow that main quest and, you know, get whatever you're going to get, or you can just, like, get lost in a side quest because it sounds interesting. <laughs> and you can actually win that way, uh, doing an effective enough job with the side quest. Uh, and you're all pulling from the deck, and it's... It, I actually personally love it. I know I'm kind of bleeding into my positives over here, but I can't talk about it without really saying, oh, wow, this is really cool. Um, and the quests run like the Crossroads cars in Dead of Winter, where they're options. So you can do a certain thing, like let's say you run into a girl on the road. Do you shoot her in the face or do you give her candy? <laughs> Not to spoil anything, but it's choices like that. So then if you shoot her in the face, you have to make like a certain check, maybe a strength check. Uh, and then if you decide to give her candy, you give her, make a charisma check, uh, depending on what you're good at. So if you have a strength character, you might, you're kind of led towards certain choices, right? Um, so, and that's how that will determine which quest you pull from the deck. So, uh, that's kind of how the story branches in different ways. If you're playing multiplayer, it's kind of a race to complete those quests. So you got to get to the places. If you notice somebody's going for a certain quest line that you might, you know, divert to go to another quest path. So that's kind of how that plays out in the multiplayer. Uh, the last part I'll talk about in terms of game mechanics is combat. Yes, there's combat, and there's a reason why I put it last. Combat is, um, it, you can kind of win that way. In fact, it's how you get experience and how you can complete the quest. But combat is definitely the, the means towards completing the quest in that respect. And they're like impediments there. So you're going to have little enemy chips and... You don't roll a ton of dice in this game. You don't have like it's not Eldritch Horror or, or these other games where you roll like or you get like a fistful of dice. You just roll them. Uh, it's only three dice, and they're along the VAT system from the video game. So they depict the they're highlighted little body parts. So then there's a head, and there's a torso, there's some arms, and um, it's just funny to make uh, to think of it because like you know because you'll you'll fight an enemy and the enemy has those same things highlighted. So like you have to hit an enemy in an arm in order to kill it, which I don't know, not sure why. Maybe they have like full body armor and only their arms are exposed. Not really sure how that works. But hey, that's how it works. You have to match what you roll to what the uh, the vulnerability is on the monster. You had to make enough hits to hit, make the hit points. They're dead. You get their experience. Really, really simple. Um, on the same dice, there's a reprisal system of like dots. So like you're going to take some damage and then they take damage, but it's on one roll. You don't have to like roll opposing, you know, like a roll dodge or something like that. Having that one roll just really made things really, really fast. Uh, so yeah, so that's I can go through all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's terrain. Don't forget okay. the health. Yeah, the health and the um, yeah, yeah, the radiology health. stuff or whatever it's called. Yeah, right. Uh, and I guess the the last thing I'll mention in terms of game elements is the way the health system works. Pretty unique. It's not just health. So like you start at like 15 health and you take damage. You're gonna take damage in this game. If you if you uh, attack monsters or some of the quests will do damage to you too. You're gonna take it. You have to rest often and get your health back. The twist here is there's also radiation damage, which basically lowers your maximum hit point threshold. So it's a it's a green tracker on your little tracker dice, and it just it, it basically like if your health your base health is zero, it'll raise your base health to one, two, three, four, five, effectively lowering your overall health. So the way you die in this game, if if you go to if you go to quote unquote zero, then you'll just go back, spawn back, whatever. Who cares? But if your radiation level is at 
like the max of your health, then you die, <laughs> you know? which is hard. Like you, there's not a lot of things that give radiation. You can just avoid those areas that give radiation. But sometimes you want to go in the radiation because the quest puts you there. And that's where the tension of the game is because sometimes it's like, oh, I got to complete this quest. It's in a radiation zone, but I've already taken 12 points of radiation damage. If I take any more, I, I will spawn and I'll just die immediately and be eliminated from the game. There you go. Should I also talk about the agenda cards? Well, I don't know why I'm avoiding talking about the agenda card. That's the other way how you win. I, I, I'm going to get to the negatives of the game. Uh, the agenda cards are this card. You pull them, you get one secretly, and, you, and it establishes a victory condition for you. So there's going to be like factions on the board, and you have to like either favor a faction or another faction. This the, not you don't have to worry about that too much. It's that I think it's I think that stuff is secondary to the quest system actually. Um, but anyway, so like g- gaining favor one or the other, you get an agenda card. If you uncover um, all sorts of areas in the map, you might get an agenda card that does that. As you go through the game, you'll get more agenda cards, and that's how you score victory points. In the solo game, if you get 11 uh, influence before the kind of in-game timer happens, you win. So, you know, pretty simple with that stuff. Um, the positives. I kind of baked them into my description. Um, the It's fast. This is a fast game. Like, for a big Eldritch Horror-sized game, you can get through a game pretty quickly. You're not doing a whole bunch of rolling. You're not figuring out plus one, plus two, plus three. You're not rolling opposed things for the enemies like in some other games you're doing it. It's three dice. You get re-rolls based on a weapon you use or what skills you have, and that's it. It is fast, and you can just calculate damage really fast and just keep on and keep it rolling. Uh, I really did appreciate that. So, like, you know, if you're playing Mansion of Madness, for example, you might be there two plus hours. In Fallout, that'll take 90 minutes or less. Uh, even less if you're playing solo. 90 minutes is like a multiplayer game. Really the best part of the game. You are here for the quest system. Oh, Lord. I love this thing. I love the quest. And I love the crossroad system in Dead of Winter. I love the option one and two. Um, this, with the fact that you're going into the deck... And you're following an actual coherent story. You're not just, you know, uh, going to the Antarctica and searching for Cthulhu. And then all of a sudden you're transported to the Serengeti and you're looking for this other thing. And that's your quest. It's like, that's cool. And it's fun. It's its, its own kind of fun. I, I love that game. But this is another level. I mean, this is like just the fact that you're able to, to follow a train of thought. And, you know, you follow a woman. You find the woman. She runs into the woods. In the woods you find a cult. And then the cult will off make this offer, and then you go back into the town, and do you accept the offer? You know, oh my goodness. And that was such a revelation. People wonder if that's going to hurt replayability. It's actually not because of how much it branches. We'll get to this with Legacy of Dragonhold in a second. They, it does a similar thing in terms of, like, it's a story, but it offers branches. So, like, if you go to one place and you make one choice, then it'll set you off in a whole different direction. You can play the same mission again. Get to that same place, make the different choice, and then just get set off on this whole other thing. This is a fantasy flight game, so you're not going to get a whole ton of content in the box out of the way, out of the jump. But at least there's enough for you know you can get through all five missions that are included in the box and still have room to to explore some un, untended to uh, quest threads, which is which I thought was super cool. So replayability good, um, quest system good. Fast and it's fast. It's the dice rolling is really really good. Negatives, not a high player count game. There's, it's cooperative, but it, that's a, that's in quotes. You, there's no cooperation. <laughs> like you can trade items if you're resting together. That's it. You're not collaborating to beat monsters. You're not collaborating to complete quests. Maybe you can ask. You know, like secretly, you're not supposed to like you know reveal your faction. But let's say you do. You actually have the option to reveal your faction. You can actually, if another person has that same have that same faction, be like, okay, let's work together and do that. But that's like a special edge case. There's no real reason to cooperate. So, you know, and there's a lot of downtime. There's nothing you can do like in between, like while other people are going. So don't play this at four plays. I just don't recommend it. One or two, good. Anthony. <laughs> Anthony played this. And when I was playing this, I was enjoying it for the quest. I kept on thinking of Anthony because I'm thinking, man. If Anthony sat here and played this, that he would be just totally bored. Anthony, you sat here and played this. How did you feel? Totally bored. Totally bored. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It's there's so many. Here's the thing about this game. As I was playing, I was like, "That's clever. That's cool. I like that. That's a good system." And then as the game goes on, I'm like, "What exactly is the point of this?" Hey, look, there's enemies. 
I'll just go around them. Hey, look, there's an agenda card. It's the same as this other agenda card, which is the same as this other agenda card. <laughs> like it's, I don't know. It, it just felt, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it wasn't even that long, you know, hour, hour and a half, and it still felt like a slog to me. And just so everybody listening knows, if you don't know, uh, this isn't really my type of game anyways. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm not a big adventure game, narrative only type of guy, but man, it just doesn't do much. It doesn't challenge you very much. Uh, to do anything. Yeah, this game is my type of game. Elder Tar is in my top 10 personal of all time. This is not Elder Tar. Like, not even that. Like, people say that's a dice fest. At least you're challenged. At least you can, like, die. Like, th- in this one, you can really tra-la-la past enemies, and the only enemies that trigger are ones that have, like, a lot of lightning bolt symbol, which says, okay, aggressive, uh, it'll attack you. The only way enemies attack you is if you start in their space. And you better be desperate to be in that space if you start in a space with a monster. So, like, even, like, the big, scary little radiation monster dudes with, like, three health, which is a, a huge amount in this game, because you can only kill enemies, like, at once. You can't, like, chip away at it. Either you kill it or you don't. So, those aren't threatening at all, because you don't have to stop in their space. <laughs> like, just go and do your thing. Or, like, you know, if, especially if you're playing cooperatively, maybe you can have, like, one guy run around and chase, you know, they follow that dude so that the other person can complete the quest. That's, I guess... But no, that's that's not going to work. Uh, so that so as a tactical experience, I see some people on 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 uh, Facebook and on BGG saying, "Oh wow, it really is tactical. Uh, you make some different decisions, especially with the radiation, the tearing, all kind of stuff." Tactical is not the same thing as challenging. This game is not challenging on the board. It's challenging on the quest. If you don't roll <laughs> uh, what you need to roll, and you, and you try to go after things that you know, let's say you're trying to go after like a, a certain skill, a charisma skill, and you're not a charisma character. That's a problem, but that's not challenging. Like on the board, it's just not a challenging game. So I was in it. I love the quest system. I, as a board game, I just felt it, it left a lot to be desired. You did play this, right, Colin? I certainly did. And did you like it? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm a huge adventure guy. And so I thought for sure I was going to love this. So I had it on pre order. I was pumped. I didn't know the IP. And I think that's part of the issue for me is I've never played Fallout before. So I jump in. I'm going, what is this stuff? What is radiation? Okay, I got it under. I, I figured it all out. And then I'm starting to play it. And, and it was just like what Anthony said. I was going, well, what, what's the point? What am I doing? Why are these monsters even here? Why would I kill them? Because they're just going to respawn again. It's not really helping me yeah i potentially can level up but i can actually level up by doing that through the quests and just avoid the monsters and then it just became you know you'd get all of those quest cards up and if i'm playing solo and so you've got like five different stories going on and you're going well which story do i even want to follow does it even matter (laughs) you know it just (laughs) it wasn't connecting with me and i don't i don't know i i really think it has to do with the fact i don't know the ip and then the fact that like you've just said there is no challenge it's just the, the biggest challenge is just, can you roll the right stuff when you do your quests? Other than that, you can just avoid the monsters, you can avoid the radiation, and you're, you're, you're set for life. So Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the way the designers intended it, I think they intended you to, like, hang out at certain pli- places, and if the monsters kind of gather, you have to deal with them. You don't really, you know, like, I think there's certain, like, quest markers that you have to be there and make a couple rolls, and if you fail, the monsters will catch up. If you don't fail, then you just make your check and move on. <laughs> <laughs> and the monsters just keep on running after you. And that's just, I don't know. It, again, that's a tactical board game. It left a lot to be desired. I still am over the moon for the quest system. I'm thinking of keeping it just for that because I think the fixes are there. If they just make, like I, I actually, when I first played the game, I played a mis- with a mistake that like the monsters could attack after they move, where in the rule book it's they attack before they move. That's a, that was a huge difference. Like I was like, wow, this game is hard. I got to figure this out. And then I played with the right rule, and it became like super easy. So, <laughs> so I think the fixes are in the game. I'm looking forward to what content they have. Um, again, I'm over the moon for the quest system, but as a tactical board game, yeah, you might want to think twice about this one. So that's Fallout. Okay, so we dragged Colin from his. Um, I don't know. I, I always imagine you in like this igloo up in <laughs> Minnesota, <laughs> like dragging you out out of from the igloo and. <laughs> Climbed out just far enough to get Wi-Fi so I could, you know, <laughs> call in, right? <laughs> so we dragged him out from wherever he sleeps uh, to talk about Legacy of Dragonhold. Uh, actually, what I was going to do 
was I was going to kind of crib the, the, the review of the game because I know we want to talk about it off of Colin's channel. But I'm like, oh, man, I'm friends with Colin. I could just call him and he could show up. So here he is, Colin, who has a playthrough <laughs> of Legacy of Dragonhold on his channel, One Stop Co-op Shop, and he's here to talk about his experience and what he thinks about the game. Yeah, so, uh, well, first, let's just talk a little bit about the game itself. So, Legacy of Dragonhold, it was designed by Nikki Valens and published by Fantasy Flight. It's for one to six players, and I wouldn't even call it a board game. It, it says right on the box, a cooperative narrative adventure. And I definitely agree with that, because what you're going to find inside of this box is a bunch of books. And you're going to be reading through these books and creating a character, and that's the type of game this is. It's not really... A board game. There is no board. There's a map, but there's really no board that you're going to be using. So what you'll do when you first start playing is you'll pull out an instruction book about how to create your character. Your character you get to create for yourself. You can play with one player, and that's how uh, my playthrough is. I actually really like it one player because it's very easy to make decisions. You don't have to worry about who's activated when, but you can play that with up to six of your friends, or you can play solo with multiple characters if, you, if you'd like. Uh, you got six different races. You got orc, elf, gnome, dwarf, human, and cat folk, so pretty basic. And then seven different classes that you can choose from. And th those are also standard uh, classes that you can choose from. So you have to choose from those, uh, the different races and the different classes. And then from there, you'll build your own personal backstory. Now, this backstory will be personal to you. You can make it however outlandish as you want. So like the one that I'm doing, I am an orc bard. So I was... I was an orc who met somebody who was an elf and decided that, you know what, I no longer want to be part of the orc clan. I want to go and learn how to play the didgeridoo. So, you know, you can do stuff <laughs> like that, right? Yeah, And but he can wield the didgeridoo as a weapon. Um, yeah, anyways, so you can kind of create your own backstory and then create uh, goals and ideals for your specific character. And even they even ask you to write out a description of what your character would look like. After doing that, then they'll ask you to pick skills based upon everything that you just completed. So your your class and your race will have different skills that are connected to those, and you need to choose two of each skills from those from the class and the race. But then other other than those four, you can choose any other skills up to eight. And then the tacticalness of the game or you're trying to make a decision of is if you have more skills you have less health so the more skills you have the more options you'll have during the during the actual game to make certain decisions because you can only do this if you maybe have the um I don't know whatever skill it would be like um, environment skill or whatever whatever skill it is if you need to have that skill and you have it you can take that choice but sometimes if you don't have that skill, you can't make that choice. And so the more skills you have, the more options you'll have through the playthrough. But then you'll also have less health, so it's more likely that you'll get exhausted. So you have that kind of choice um, right before you even start. Once you've created your character, you're going to be off and running and ready to start your adventure into Dragonhold. Your first adventure will take place on the road to Dragonhold, where you'll meet two characters and you'll be going with them to Dragonhold. Now, I'm not going to say anything else because I don't want to spoil the story, but that's essentially what you're going to be doing. And as you go through, you'll read for a little bit and then there'll be a question and it'll be like, do you want to go left or go right? And if you can, if you want to go left, you have to have this, this specific skill. So if you have that skill, you can choose to go left. And if you don't, well, then you just have to go right. Uh, but there'll be multiple uh, multiple options for you. And then each one that you choose kind of creates this branching story that's specific to your character, which is pretty cool. So that's how the game plays. Now, what, what I really enjoy about it is I've never really done an RPG before. And so this is my first experience of doing that, and I'm loving it. I'm having so much fun. I don't have to make a lot of decisions. I've heard so many times when you think of an RPG, you have to start from scratch. You have to come up with all this stuff about your character and all these stats. There's no stats. All you got to do is determine skills, class, race, and a backstory. Nice and simple. And what I find is my wife really, really likes it. And so we read it together in the evening. So if if I want to play a game and she's, oh, I'm tired. Well, you know what? I'll just pull this out and we can read it together. And she gets really involved in it. And really, it's, it's a great way to get somebody who doesn't like to play board games all the time to play a game with you. So I love that. Also, it has great writing it's it's some of the some of the best writing that i've seen from fantasy flight so i'm really i'm really impressed their their writers did a great job the story is engaging i mean you have to get through the first 
the first story itself, um, the first book, is just kind of getting you in. But once you get in and you get involved into the actual story, oh, it's great. It's really good writing. And then lastly, I did really like to see that the two main characters you meet at the beginning are female, and they're strong characters. And it's really fun to see Fantasy Flight show that and and have strong female characters. It was it was really cool. It was something that my wife really appreciated, and so I think it's part, it's part of the reason why I really appreciate it. For us, some of the things that we didn't like as much is, you know, there really aren't a ton of decisions for you to make. I mean, you're going to feel like you've got options, but really, if you don't pick a ton of skills, you're going to have a lot less options than normal, so or than other characters. And it just so happens the character that I chose, I chose less skills, more health, and so that just means I have less options, which is a bit of a bummer. So, But you know what? That just means I can go and play through it again with a different character, which is kind of cool. And... You know, overall, I, I really like the story itself, but I don't know if it's engaging enough for somebody who wants a real RPG, right? Because you can't make all the decisions. You can't just go off on a side quest that's totally unrelated or have something totally crazy happen. It's all confined within that book. And so sometimes I, what I've heard from other people is that you want the story to go somewhere, and it, it just doesn't, and it won't, because you can't, because you're limited by the book itself. And and lastly, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it feels like you're making these decisions, but sometimes I go, well, I wonder if it makes any difference which one I'm picking. <laughs> I wonder if the story goes the same way no matter what. And, you know, I'm not going to know that until I play through it a second time. So, yeah. But, yeah, that's that's Legacy of Dragonhold. Uh, it's funny we talk on the co-op cast. Oh, by the way, um, so I was a guest on the on co-op cast to talk about Pandemic Legacy season two. Uh, so go ahead and check out co-op cast. I probably should have said that at the beginning, not minute forty, but whatever. <laughs> hey, there you go, Peter and Mike. Um, so you mentioned that we mentioned the Telltale series on the cast. I don't know if you guys have played Telltale games. I haven't. No, not really. You guys haven't played it. So there are a series of computer games. You know what they are. They're like The Walking Dead, The Wolf oh, sure, Among yeah. Us, and yep, yep. Uh, Game of Thrones. And like basically they're like this. They're like you know interactive stories, but they present a bunch of magicians' choices where it's like a choice choice, but it leads to the same place. So like I can't tell you how many times in Game of Thrones I would like choose either to let the guy die or save the guy. I would save the guy, and then the guy would get shot with an arrow five minutes later. <laughs> Why did I save this dude? Come on. So they're talking, you know, your point about, you know, uh, different uh, paths and whether they're really that different or not. So I'm a re I am an RPG guy. Like I've actually RPG'd way longer than I've played board games. I've been I've been RPGing since high school. Uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, Pathfinder, all sorts of different systems. I guess I'm glad this product exists, you know, because it is opening up the RPG space to a board game, you know, uh, community. It just what from what you were describing, like the 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 skill system just sounds, you know, either you have the skill or you don't, and you know, let's say, and it, it sounds like it's one of those systems where it's like if you have the skill, you're going to get the better result. If you don't have it, you're going to get the worse result. Is that did you find that to be true? I yeah, I mean, unfortunately, since I've only played one time through. I don't know yet if it made a difference, right? But usually, when I have picked a uh, an option that's using a skill good things have happened. And when I have had those options, but I couldn't pick them and I had to pick a basic one, it wasn't as good of an option. At least it felt like that. So, but that doesn't mean, I, you know, I, I didn't read the other one, so I don't, I don't know what, hap what would have happened, but it feels like that for sure. Yeah, so that kind of puts it on rails. If, that, if that's true, I think, I mean, from some of the reading I've done, and I've also checked out Adam and his Rolling Solo uh, playthrough of it. So like, it just, it felt that way. So even though you have quote unquote choice, it is still determined by your skills. Like if you want to do well in the game, you're going to follow your skills and it depends on, you know, how much time you spend. So that, that part's interesting, but like in terms of the actual decision in front of you, it feels a little bit, it felt, the idea of it felt a little bit determined. I, I, to be clear, I haven't played the game, I'm just like following it, but I'm following it as an interested RPG guy who really, really wants this to be good. Uh, so I can see that being a pitfall. My biggest thing, my biggest barrier is that it's, Terranoth. Terranoth. <laughs> Can you get more generic? 
<laughs> well, they're trying to make it better, right? So, I mean, what what's cool about it is that, you know, if you're into, into a game like, let's say, Descent, and you want to know more about the world, I mean, this is where you're going to get it. So, I, I, I totally agree with you. They're, they're starting in a very generic world, but what, what, what they're doing is starting to provide you with that context of what this world means. And I appreciate that because I, I think this is what, what people have been asking Fantasy Flight to do, and they're finally doing it. They're finally giving us a little bit more more of what is this world of Terranoth other than the basic of basic of fantasy, you know? Yeah, so like maybe without spoiling things, like, you know, do dwarves do other things besides like drink beer and wield hammers? <laughs> do orcs do other? Like, I know you made it, you made your orc play the didgeridoo, but does he have to? Like, is it, does it bust through those kind of um, ingrained stereotypes? That's or a is really it just good like, point. Or is it, it just does. a deeper version than the same, of the same thing? Well, okay, so... It definitely feels like it, and and um, I would say that it actually brings up. Now, there's been some some threads on BGG as well on this, is that it brings up some social issues in our world today that uh, you wouldn't normally expect it to bring up, and and so that's been interesting as well to see how that's played out. Um, and I'm just talking about certain things like. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, the two main characters that you are with are female, and it, and it gives this connotation that, well, maybe they're actually together, you know, and, and so it's providing you this uh, this world that's not exactly the basic world that you're used to when you think of fantasy, where oh, all the orcs are big and gnarly, and all the gnomes are tiny and small, and they never they never do anything together. No, there's, there's a little bit of that that you see in the story. Yeah, I, I guess um, it's very hinty. It sounds very hinty. It sounds like they put it in front of you and they let us in our cultural context put it in yep. as opposed to like, you know, in Dark Sun, in a, a D&D universe, the elves are like these gnarled um, desert creatures that steal your stuff. And like they're, they're not elves, but they're like they have the racial trait of elves, but they have this totally like whacked out backstory. Uh, Eberron, you know, you have like the flying ships and do all, all, all this other stuff. Like the the different worlds have different, like completely different metas, where this world just seems like the same. And then they give you like they, I guess they're putting in these little hints. There's room for us to put stuff in there. I I don't know. I, I, as an RPG guy, I guess that's from my perspective. You've you have a perspective of never playing RPGs, so you so it sounds really exciting for you. For me, it it just sounds like a lot of the same. No, and I I totally get that. And that's why I think this game is more geared towards people that are more board gamers that are coming into this and looking at it from a different way than maybe someone that if you're already an RPG, you're going to go and look at this and go, why would I waste my time with it? But it's, it's more for someone like me who's going, Oh my gosh, RPGs, it would actually sound like there'd be a lot of fun. You know, uh, it, it, it's helping me and really my wife too. I mean, my wife is interested in it and that's, that's really exciting to me. And so I think that's more what this is geared towards. Not someone who is an RPGer, but a board gamer who's interested in looking at, well, what what does an RPG entail? Or someone who wants to get their wife involved, which I, I approve of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Okay, so that is three um, releases from Fantasy Flight. Uh, before we sign off, we have a little bit of time left. Um, is there any conclusions that we can make in terms of the three, do you see, are there any commonalities that you see, um, any trends that you see from Fantasy Flight? Like, how are we feeling about Fantasy Flight as a game company? Something that I've been noticing for Fantasy Flight is just how friendly they've been with, first of all, co-op games, but second of all, solo games. It's been really fun to see a large company who's, you know, when you think of a solo game, I the first thing I think of is, oh, it's going to be a Kickstarter, someone who is just trying to get additional money from backers to get, get their game funded. No, this is Fantasy Flight. This is Fantasy Flight coming out with solo, soloable games games right out of the box and that is wonderful for me as a solo gamer i really appreciate it and i just hope that they understand how much we appreciate that here in the uh, board game community so i mean that's something for me that i i'm I'm really happy about i thought you were going to say something you appreciate from the frozen north (laughs) (laughs) gives me something to do other than shovel snow you know there you go um so i'm glad you had a positive there because i guess to me like this is kind of i'm a little torn uh, playing and reading and experiencing these three games. I played the app uh, of its Pure Assault app. I'm looking at Dragon Hold. I played Fallout, obviously. 
it, it feels all of it feels very safe. Like I'm driving a 2018 Camry. I drove the 2016 Camry. I've drove the 2014 Camry, like the previous iterations of these games. And it just feels like they're kind of moving the ball forward very, very slowly. I it, it like I was playing Fallout. I'm like, okay, I could see the Eldritch horrorness of it, and I could see how they borrowed from these other games of it. Um, you know, Legacy of Dragonhold, like, you know, this is like the best version of a choose your own adventure game, but it's a choose your own adventure. Um, so the Imperial Assault app is the exact same thing as the Descent app. That Imperial Assault that could have come out like a week after the Descent app. And it has like a fraction of the content, and it's basically the same screen layout, and it, the the terrain is basically the same. I don't know. Like I, I I'm torn. Like I, I'm, like I said, uh, Colin, I really appreciate that you pointed it out. It's a big company that is taking care of the solo lovers, the co-op lovers, the adventure game lovers. Um, but that's really, really cool. Uh, I don't know if they specifically have solo in mind. I think they have co-op in mind, and it just happens to work out that it's solo. I'll, I'll take it. Um, but it, I wish they a company like that would take more risks. Like Arkham Horror, when it first came out, was like a big risky game. Gloomhaven, Seven Continent, these are big risky games. These games just they feel a little bit warmed over, I guess. And so I'm, maybe that's just a me thing. I don't. I don't know. That's why I'm kind of putting it out there. I don't know, man. That's tough though, because you. you you couldn't expect a big company like Fantasy Flight to do something like Gloomhaven or whatever because they don't use Kickstarter. You know, they're putting their own capital into it. Um, and at the same time, you know, Grain of Salt and everything, but, you know, the, the whole Asmodee mega yeah. company that's coming together, it's all about the bottom line, right? So they have to play it mostly safe. And I don't, I don't think they're being, I don't think they're ignoring things too much, but they are definitely leaning back on things like miniatures games, which they didn't do before, or collectible card games, which they didn't do before. Um, which are kind of cash cows. Um, so I'm still happy to see, though, that they're doing some of these slightly outside the box board games or coming back like to Imperial Assault, a game that they didn't need to add anything to. People are still buying stuff for and giving them more content. Um, the results of those things are a little safe, but it's at least more than they need to do. You know, they, if they want to make money, they don't need to do all these extra things. Um, so it's nice to see them not playing not being risky but not at least completely insulating back to the to the core money makers yeah i guess so i'm I'm just a little bit torn i guess uh, it's more of a oh no I, I i'm afraid that it's going to be even more generic in the future like these games are fine um you know i think people there is people are loving the imperial assault app even if it doesn't have enough content uh fallout has its fans i mean these games have their fans these games have their niches they're they're useful in their own ways I guess just for me, in terms of the, you know, I, I like innovation. I like when people push the button. And I don't expect Fantasy Flight to necessarily do that. I just want to, like, kind of call it out and be like, okay, um, this is cool, but let's look for the let's say look for and encourage the other stuff as well. So that's kind of where I'm at. All right. Totally. So um, that was the uh, three big Fantasy Flight releases here for the end of the year. Uh, Colin, thanks again, man, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Kind of saved our bacon on the Dragon Hunt review. Not a problem. Uh, any time, right? Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> 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 uh, so that's going to be everything for this week, guys. Uh, make sure you stop on by Facebook. Check us out there um, in the Board Gamers Anonymous group as well as the Solo Board Gaming group. Uh, you can find us on uh, everynightisgamenight.com as part of boardgamersanonymous.com and on Twitter at ENGN underscore podcast. Um, make sure to let us know what you think. If you have different thoughts, opinions, questions, whatever it is about these three games or any other Fantasy Flight games maybe we haven't talked about that you'd like to hear us talk about. Uh, but until next time, go ahead and grab a solo game off the shelf and let's make every night game night. Later, everybody. Well, yeah, and Kevin, Kevin is a fun guy to talk to. He actually taught me Mage Knight. So really? he, sat, yeah, he sat on Skype with me for four and a half hours on a Friday night. No, he didn't. No, God. Yes, he did until 2 o'clock in the morning. I had, my, I had my little overhead cam, and we literally walked through a game of Mage Knight together for four and a half hours. No, he didn't. He oh did. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's how I learned it. And I was What'd like, you oh do? My God. You reached out to him and said, dude, spend all night with me? No. <laughs> No, so he said that he, he thought Mage Knight was amazing. And I was like, oh, come on. I mean, that game's forever. It takes so long. It, it can't be something that's good. He said, I will teach you if you think that you're going to like it. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So 
he he sat down with me on a Friday. He was in oh man, what is he? In our, I can't remember what state he's in. He's right in now. Kentucky. Kentucky, yes, he's in Kentucky. I'm here in Minnesota, and started at seven o'clock one 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 evening and went all the way to like two o'clock in the morning, and we had a blast. It was fun. Dude, that is a sick story. Don't yeah. don't let that get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me tell you though now i really know how to play mage knight because i think he's played that about a hundred times so and yeah. i'm not even exaggerating <laughs>